The night in Westgate was one of those murky affairs. Moon playing hide and seek with the clouds, mist creeping in from the harbour like a ghostly visitor. It's the kind of night where every shadow has a story to tell, and none of them are bedtime tales. Now, these vague wheels. Picture floating skulls with leathery wings, fangs that make a dragon wince, and eyes that glowed with an otherworldly hunger. Nasty customers. Suddenly, there they were, materialising in the misty dockside alley, wings unfurling like a pair of demonic bats ready to swoop in for the kill. The air turned thick with their unearthly shrieks, which could make a banshee cover her ears. I was waiting for something to burst out of the shadows. I just didn't know what I was going to be dealing with exactly. Going by the silence and lack of ecology in what would normally be a rather busy old network of stone tunnels and stinking ponds. Like most undead, the Vargwheels have a way of scaring off the usual suspects. Stray dogs hightailed it. Street cats arched their backs and hissed, and even the gutter vermin scattered like they owed rent. Where did these flying skulls come from, you ask? Abyssal origins, most likely. Maybe someone messed up a summoning ritual, or they slipped through a crack in the plan of fabric. Who can say? Abyssal bureaucracy is a mystery even to me. Most likely, they were the side effect of some cult summoning ritual that they were unprepared for and let escape into the city tunnels. I was not exactly ready for them either. I resolved to get out of their hunting ground, back to the street where I could avoid them, and make my way to the Arcane Academy to talk to some abjurationists about a clean-up job, exterminating them. Spellcasters who train to deal with the undead and how to fight malevolent magic usually appreciate simple training runs like that for the young apprentice, spell wards, and arcane investigators. In my hasty retreat, I darted through the city's underbelly, winding through narrow alleys and dodging through market squares. Westgate's a maze, but a halfling with a knack for sneaking can find the hidden paths. In the quiet corner near the city walls, the Vargwheels were tangled in my concoction of spider silk web. Their screeches echoing off the stone walls, a cacophony that the undead terrors could keep up all night at full volume. With a twirl and a flick, I chanted words of celestial authority, banishing the winged horrors back to the abyss. The mist seemed to recoil at the release of their unearthly cries, leaving behind only the lingering scent of arcane residue. As the echoes faded and the mist settled, I stood amidst the desolation. Vargoil bits scattered like fallen leaves. The charm of foresight dangled from my fingers, a silent witness to the dance between sage and shadow. And so, Westgate, ever shrouded in mystery, sighed in relief. The night, now quieter, held its secrets a little tighter, and I slipped away into the confines of a sleek sailing ship. I had no time to spend finding out where the Vargwheels had come from. I had important business to deal with at Luskin, and I was running late. Not to be confused with the Penangal, a kind of blood-drinking flying head that floats around dragging its entrails and lungs along with it, the Vargwil is a unique kind of demon undead that can replicate like a plague-like speed in dense replicated centers if not dealt with swiftly. They began in the original white box of Dungeons & Dragons in 1974, and the creature has evolved over different game editions, but some core elements remain consistent. The Vargwil is a grotesque, bat-winged monster with a horrifying ability. Its kiss can transform a creature into Vargwil itself. The creature is known for its hideous appearance, which includes a fanged maw and a series of tendrils hanging from its chin. It often lurks near human settlements, preying on unsuspecting victims. The name Vargwil itself is derived from the French word Vargwili, which means gargoyle or grotesque figure. This reflects the creature's monstrous and grotesque nature. There is a harpy vibe to the creatures with the way they scream. When a Vargwila shrieks, each humanoid and beast within 30 feet of it that can hear it must make a DC 12 wisdom saving throw or be stunned until the end of the Vargwil's next turn. If the saving throw is successful, the target is immune to the stunning shriek of all the wheels for one hour. 
The Varguil can hold off on inflicting the cursed kiss. They are there to gorge themselves with the blood of the living, and they have a particularly savage thirst, even by vampire standards. Even the freshly transformed Guil head is lethal. The first blood they drink is that of their own body. Immediately after, their head tore free of the neck. It sunk its fangs in and lapped the stump greedily. In the abyssal dimensions, Varguils buzz around like swarms of nightmare mosquitoes, looking for easy targets to feed on and harass. They are so common, they can be accidentally summoned along with other creatures that they happen to be hiding in or dug in, feeding on them like a tick. Varguil are very difficult to control, but they avoid brightly lit areas in favour of darkness, so that, they, that way they can be moved along. The bite of the Varguil, according to lore, is far more formidable than the version presented in 5th edition D&D. According to the Planescape Monstrous Compendium printed in 1994, the distended maw can deliver a bite loaded with venom, which prevents any form of healing. Though neutralized poison works, as does a heal or regenerate spell, and the wish spell of course, several bites from different Varguils can swiftly neutralize their prey. Varguils gather in packs and clusters. It could be as small as pairs or mobs that contain up to 11 members, against which a single person has slim chances of survival, making the Varguil swarm a significant threat to a humanoid settlement. With dragons and other apex monsters, settlements, forts and fortified towns tend to be able to field at least a semi-decent squad of basically equipped defenders. And with armor class levels and 5th edition plus reduced hit point pools, even creatures like dragons and giants can be taken down reliably with a steady application of round-by-round -round mass counterattacks. Even relatively unskilled, the damage total quickly mounts up and overcomes significant threats. Dudley so if the town militia or guards happen to own a siege weapon. But throw a swarm of deadly, small, fast-moving and challenging Varguils at them. They have little effect and will probably be the first victims of the lethal flying heads. This is why having some specialists in the mysterious arts can be so important, and a cleric's simple ability to remove poison can save an entire town. I recall a story about that happening in the cold, distant and harsh land of Narfel. I was on the far southern side of the continent when I heard it. My journey beyond Candlekeep's venerable walls was both exhilarating and filled with promise of uncharted knowledge. My destination, the lively lands of Lurin, where the bulk of my family still lived, where an old friend, Jadra Bared, waiting tales from realms unknown and awaiting my load of journals to exchange with him. Jadra carried my books far and wide, selling copies on my behalf. As I approached Jadra's caravan, the air carried the scent of Lurin spices, mingled with the incense he sold, wafting smoke that smelled of honey and wildflowers. Jadra greeted me with open arms, laughter echoed as we embraced, the years melting away in the warmth of our friendship. Over a meal of dried fruits, strong spirits, questionable cheeses, Cured sausages and fresh salads, Jadra began weaving a tapestry of tales about the old empire of Narfel, a realm steeped in demon-summoning magic. My mind raced to connect the dots between Narfel's demonic past and fragments of known knowledge within the Candlekeep's sacred halls. I hauled out my journals and maps, and we pored over them while downing more cups of the very flammable delicacies. We traced the contours of the land with nimble fingers and whispered about artifacts and ruins of forgotten lands and bygone eras. When Jadra seized by a fit of kindness and insisted I take his old amulet of daylight, a simple but renewable, remarkable object was just a crystal set into a little hand lantern box. It charges up on sunlight during the day and releases it in the darkness, faster and far stronger. A potent tool against the Varguil and many other types of creature that call darkness home. Varguil eyes and fangs are sought after by alchemists for their many magical properties, but must be kept in darkness. In the abyssal plains, the Varguils exist in ragged swarms, lacking fresh victims most of the time they are regarded as little more than vermin and sport, subsisting on other pests, carrion and the echo of dead fiends, with the occasional lone mane or dretch being torn apart and eaten by a large flock of Varguil. These creatures spread like a virulent plague when let loose on the material plane, feeding on those stunned by their horrific wailing 
and within as little as a few hours transforming those victims into new Varguil and more headless corpses. These living victims inflicted with the curse can do little but seek out magical cures while each hour they lose their hair, start to grow fangs and sprout vile tentacles from their scalp and chin. And in the final stages, they sprout horns and the ears rapidly grow into leathery wings large enough to easily lift the head once it rips itself free of the neck. The intelligence and personality of the victim during this process slowly degrade to a bestial level. And by the time tentacles start to move on their own, the victim will no longer answer to their old name and lose their ability to speak just before the horns start to grow. Varguils are native to the abyss. Some random planet distortion was what originally spawned the first of them, I think. Now they are found on all the lower planes, most notably the Tartarian depths of Hades, where they swarm in the sky above vast networks of caves that resemble pandemonium quite a bit. Particularly when the Varguils start shrieking and that blood-curdling sound echoes off the walls and the countless chambers. There is a legend about a lich called the Blood Queen, who was said to have created the first Varguils, and now sells mobs of them which swarm to her family coat of arms, as though trained. You can find her plying the gaping moor in a three-masted sailing vessel made entirely of the skin and bones of her enemies. The first Varguils to appear in the world of Toril were found in the ruined kingdoms of old Zakara, but in Faerun, they are mostly from Narfel, dispersing from there all across the continent via the Underdark. There is a lot of false information circulating about these monsters, so let me tell you that the hedge wizards who sell copies of the Blood Queen's coat of arms for protection from the Varguil, that doesn't work. Also, they can cross through circles of salt or filed iron, and they are not kept at bay by the light of a consecrated candle. They don't, well, just don't buy any of their worthless trinkets and stick with some healing and affliction removal potions of reputable origins. That's all from me for now, but as always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.